Welcome to Freedom Church. I'm glad you're here, whether you're in the room, you're watching online. Let's pray together real quick. Dear Lord, we love you. We're grateful for you, and we pray right now for each person that's within the sound of my voice today. I pray that you would speak powerfully to their heart, to their life. I pray that you would do what only you can do today by speaking to us individually as if we were the only person in the room. Lord, we need you. We want you. We desire for you to speak to our hearts. Help us not to walk out of here or away from our television or however it is we're tuning in. Help us not to walk out of here the same way that we walked in. Lord, we love you. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. I'm glad you're here today. We're kicking off a brand new series. Uh, it's called Death to Religion, and it'll make a lot of sense before the day is done and then as the days uh, get moving as well throughout the course of this series. But I want to I wanna start off by telling you this question that I consistently used to ask myself all the time. I ask myself this question a lot more uh, than I probably should have, but one of the questions I used to wrestle around in my mind with years ago was, I wonder what it is that God thinks about me. Like, I wonder what God thinks about me. And sometimes I would wonder it, and I had like a really good week or something, and I was like, I kind of moved the ball down the field in a way that I should have. I wasn't overly ridiculous. I didn't get in any arguments with my wife or my kids. I just had a good week. Doesn't happen all the time. Doesn't happen very often, but I did. And in those moments, I would say, I wonder what God thinks about me right now. And in my mind, I would think, I bet, I bet God thinks I'm kind of awesome because I had a good week. You know what I'm talking about? But then there was a lot of weeks and a lot of days where I would ask myself the question, and I had the opposite of what it is that I just described to you. And I remember thinking, I am probably, I am probably one of God's stupid children. Right now, I am sitting over here. He is not pleased with me. He is probably frowning on me. He is probably sick and tired of me. He loves me because he is contractually obligated to do so. But there is no way that he likes me. That is uh, how it is that I thought about God. And I wrestled with this all the time. You remember seesaws when you were a little kid? I almost brought one up here, but I am way too big to be getting on a seesaw. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about? You go up and down. I don't even know what the point of that is. But that's kind of how I felt in my relationship with God. It was like I was constantly on a seesaw. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. I'm on a roller coaster. It's up and down and left and right. And, and it was just, it was just really difficult for me. And maybe it's not for you. Maybe you are just, you just love Jesus way more than I ever did. And you've already nailed this. If so, that's awesome. I hope that we can get there by the end of the series. But if you're like me, this was a real deal struggle for you. And it might still be. Like right now, I want you, don't answer it out loud, but I want you to answer in your mind. What is it that God thinks when you come to his mind? What is it that God thinks about you? And you, you wrestle with that a little bit. I want you to wrestle with it. Like, I want you to think about an answer. What does God think about you? Not, not the you that you portray on social media. Not that you, because that's like the picture-perfect, highlight real you. I'm talking about the real you, the unedited version of you, the you that the people around you don't even really get a full glimpse of because you have to at least pretend to be on your best behavior at times. I'm talking about the real you. Nobody's looking. Nobody's ever going to know the things you do, the things you say, the things that you think that you. What does God think whenever it is that he thinks about you? And here's the question. With the question, how did you decide how it is that God thinks about you? I want to show you how most, of us, how most of us do this. Which color do I want? They should just give me one because when there's three, it's, it's very difficult to choose my ADD. So here's how, most of us, here's how most of us decide. We've got ourselves, I'm the worst drawer in the world, but I can draw an awesome stick, man. I'm going to draw this also. I'm going to draw a smiley face up here that's going to represent God. And I'm going to draw a frowny face up here that also represents God. Now, this is how most of us think that God thinks about us and how it is that that is decided. Maybe, maybe you became a follower of Jesus like I did. I was 16 years old whenever it is that that happened. And I just said yes to Jesus. I, I stood and turned away from religion 
I knew about religion. I grew up in church my whole life. I knew the rules to follow. I knew all that stuff. But on that day, April the 11th, 1996, I actually said yes to Jesus. And when I did, they said, here's some things that now you need to do. And so some of those things, I'm not going to write them in here. I'll just write some boxes. There's a lot of boxes. I mean, a whole lot of boxes. I mean, there's boxes for days. I can just write more and more boxes. Stuff like, first thing you got to do, you got to get baptized, definitely. I mean, that's the very first command that God gives. Once you become a follower of Jesus, you get baptized. So I said yes to Jesus on April the 11th of 1996. I got baptized on April the 14th. I mean, I did it. I'm like, I am following the dang rules. You know what I mean? I am getting baptized. Then they said, the next thing you got to do, you got to read your Bible. And no matter how much you read it, you probably should have read it more than that. And so if you read it for five minutes, somebody will come along and you tell them that, I read it for five minutes. Somebody will say, well, I read my Bible for 10 minutes. And then you get to 10 minutes and somebody else will read it for 15. And every time you do it, they just make you feel like you're the worst person in the world or you love Jesus less than them because you didn't read as much as they did, right? But as long as you read your Bible, that's a good start. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've got to read your Bible. More boxes, you've got to pray. You know, MC Hammer said you got to pray just to make it today. You got to, you got to pray. You got to put it on there, right? Some of you are like, MC who? Who is this? You got to read your Bible. You got to pray. You, you got to, what else? Oh, you got to go to church. I mean, y'all are at church. You're watching church. It's good. Here we are. We're not doing a political series anymore, which I'm praising the Lord for. We're doing like a series that I actually like. Y'all better be clapping, not because it's over. You better be clapping because... I don't even know why. I'm clapping because it's over. That's the reason I'm clapping. Y'all had to have it, though. Y'all are going crazy online. I had to, I had to try to fix some of y'all. <laughs> going to church. Going to church. You got to do that. Oh, you got to tithe. That's a good thing to do. That's the one that most people are like, I don't want to do. I'll do all the rest of them. I don't want to do that one. You got to tithe 10% of your income back to God through the context of the local church. All these boxes, all these things you got to do. And if you do all the things... Be a nice person. Hit delete instead of send on some of the stuff you were getting ready to post over the course of the last month or so, maybe even, maybe even now. If you follow these rules and you check off these boxes, then God will be pleased with you. But what if you have those weeks where you're like, oh, you, you ever like woke up at the end of the week and you literally, I, I read my Bible on my phone. I have Bible plans on my phone and it tells me if I miss days and stuff. And I'll go on there, and I'm like, oh, dear God, I haven't read the Bible in like six days. I bet the Lord must hate me right now. He is probably like, that's not, a, he ain't no real pastor. He forgot to read his Bible on Tuesday. Real pastors would never forget to read their Bible on Tuesday. And a matter of fact, he also forgot on Wednesday. And Wednesday is kind of a church day. How can you forget to read your Bible on a church day? That's crazy. He must hate me. I am now frowning on him. Or... You yelled at your kids, you yelled at your spouse, or your relationships are all jacked up, or you had a really rough weekend. It was your own fault. You had a rough weekend. It was, it was crazy. You're here today. Praise the Lord. Loud sounds still hurt your head. But right now, the Lord, in your mind, when I said, what does the Lord think about you? That's what popped into your brain. And you're thinking, the Lord must definitely not be pleased with me. He's probably frowning on me. Have you ever had those weeks where you're getting ready to pray and read your Bible, or you know you need to pray about something that's serious, but because of the week you had, you get ready to pray, but then you don't pray because you're like, I need to get a good day under my belt first so that God will be more prone to answer my prayer. You ever done this before? Say yes if you have. You're like, you're like, oh, I need to pray. I got, I got this big thing. Dear, oh, you don't want to hear from me yet. Let me get, let me, let me be really extra good today. And when I'm really extra good today, I can get closer to him smiling on me. And if he's smiling on me, he's more likely to answer my prayer and to do what it is that I need him to do, what it is that I'm asking him to do. And it's crazy because that's how most of us live our entire lives. And many of us, as followers of Jesus, we just constantly are like I was for a long time, just on this roller coaster, up and down, left and right, on the seesaw, if you will, up and down, up and down, up and down, wondering what it is that God thinks about us and trying to figure out what it is that we need to do about it. Now, I want to show you something today in the context of the series, Death to Religion. My goal is not to attack the what, church attendance, 
reading your Bible, prayer, tithing, baptism. I'm not attacking the what. What I'm going to do over the course of the next four or five weeks is I am going to, I am going to attack the why like you've never seen before. The what is good, but the why most people do it is what keeps you from enjoying it. Because for most of us, if these are got to's and things you got to do for God to be pleased with you, we're missing the point. Jesus did not come to this earth so that you would be religious. Jesus did not come to this earth to institute a religion. A religion is man's attempt to get to God. Jesus had to come to earth to fight religion in a lot of ways. Matter of fact, religion, for many people out there, and maybe even you, religion is either getting in the way of your relationship with God or it's keeping you from a relationship with God and you are unaware Sometimes religion is actually the thing that's holding you back. Religion is just any system that says you have to check off some boxes in order for God to be pleased with you. And a lot of people, maybe even many in this room, not maybe, many in this room and many watching online, you claim to be a follower of Jesus, but you were like most followers of Jesus in that prior to becoming and saying yes to Jesus, especially if you grew up going to church, you weren't a follower, you were just religious. And religious, being religious won't get you into heaven. It'll actually, in a lot of ways, keep you out. And so what I want to do today is I really want to, I want to show you that religion needs to die in your life. And when religion will die in your life, you will see that there's a better way. Because following and checking things off the list and putting the check mark in the boxes will not, I repeat, will not get you closer to God. I want to show you how this thing was supposed to work. Hopefully, we'll cover a lot today. What we don't cover today, we'll jump into next week. But for the context of this moment, religion has to die for the gospel to actually win. And you say, what, what's, what's that? What's, that's a church term, gospel. It is a church term, but gospel just means good news. That's all it means. The reason it's good news is because the gospel is that Jesus came to earth. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He died a sacrificial death. He was buried in the ground for three days. And then he came crashing out of the tomb, conquering death, hell, and the grave. And that is good news. Now, the reason it's good news is because apart from that, all of us are so jacked up, there was nothing we could do to get to God. I mean, we were, all of you, some of you needed to hear somebody say that because you think that you're God's gift to the earth and you are the picture of perfection. You just need to know that you are messed up. You're a messed up, jacked up individual. So am I. We all are together. We are in this together. We are some messed up jokers in this place called Freedom Church. Whether you're in the room or you're watching online, we are messed up. And as a result, somebody had to do something about it. We needed good news. The fact that you're messed up, that's bad news. We needed good news. I'm going to read you this verse out of the Bible, and I'm going to read it real slow because I want to talk about it for a second. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him, who's him? Him is Jesus. God made Jesus his son who had no sin. In other words, God made his perfect son. Perfect. I don't mean like, you know how you have a baby, and you're like, oh, my little son is perfect. No, no, ma'am, they're not. You'll figure that out in the next few weeks, that they are not perfect. Uh, they're not perfect when they first come out. I remember when my kids came out and the doctor was like, do you want to hold them? And I'm like, after you wash them. Uh, because I do, I do not want all that up on me. That is, that is not, people are like, birth is beautiful. No, sir, it is not. <laughs> it is not beautiful. It's amazingly disgusting. And the outcome is great. And once they're clean, it's amazing. And their little 
head, you know, they put that stuff on there and every baby's head smells really good like the little tiny babies. The rest of them smells terrible. Uh, ADD moment, I'm very sorry. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Think about this. You're so messed up and I am so messed up that somebody had to pay the penalty of how messed up we are. In order for us to have a relationship with God, somebody has to pay. And the only person that can pay the penalty is someone who is perfect. Here's the problem. Nobody is perfect. No, not one is what it says in the Bible. Save one person who is Jesus, the Son of God. So the only option for us to have a relationship with God is not by checking things off a list. The only option for us to have a relationship with God is through a perfect person who was willing to become sin for us. Enter Jesus. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Now watch this. So that we might become the righteousness of God. In other words... When you say yes to Jesus, for me, April the 11th, 1996, the day I said yes to Jesus, all my wickedness, stupidity, all the sin, all the stuff, all the junk, all the things I've said, done, thought, all that was taken off of me and it was placed on Jesus. And in that same moment, boom, just like that, the goodness of God was put on me. And so from the, that instant, April the 11th of 1996, when God looked at me, even on my worst day, you know what it is that he thought about me? He would look at me, right now he would look at me, and he would say, that is the righteousness of God. Now when I said to you, what is it that God thinks about you? I doubt that there are very many people that are in this room or watching online who said, I'll tell you what he thinks about me. I'm the righteousness of God. But that's exactly who you are if you're a follower of Jesus. He says you are the righteousness of God. When he looks at you, he is smiling down on you. He's not saying, ah, that's my little mess up kid. He always messes up, but I do love him. No, he says that's my perfect son or that's my perfect little girl. Even on the weeks and the days and the months or the years or the decades that you have lived a ridiculously dumb life. If you are a follower of Jesus, God says to you, that's my boy or that's my girl. He loves you and he likes you. And when he sees you, he does not see the sin that you see. He sees the life that Jesus lived on your behalf. That's amazing to me. It, it's amazing to me to think that, that, that God has the ability to give me his goodness as a gift. He gave it. I didn't earn it. It's not like when you say yes to Jesus, you go out and you prove yourself. And once you prove yourself, then he'll smile at you forever. That's not the way it works. That's the way we make it sound, though. I've heard people say, and those of you that have been around for a long time, I say this a lot. Not everything that sounds good is good. So you'll hear people say, you'll you even get like people will put it on their car or on like on their body or something. And it'll say, Jesus died for me, so I will live for him. That sounds good, but it's not good because Jesus did not just die for you. Jesus also lived for you. In other words, Everything you're trying to do in order to prove yourself to God, God already did as a way to prove himself to you. He did the work. Jesus is the one who did the work. Not just when it comes to salvation, but how it is that you grow as a follower of Jesus. Jesus does the work. So as we think about this and as we come to that realization, we can begin to understand that God sees me. Watch this. When God sees me, the answer to that question, what does God think when God thinks about you? The answer to that question is not based on the week I've had. The answer to that question is based on the life Jesus lived. God could never do anything. Or let me rephrase it. 
I could never do anything to make God love me any more than he does right now. Why? Because there's nothing Jesus could do to make God love Jesus more than he does right now. So there's nothing I could do to make God love me more, but here's the thing that is hard to understand and believe. There's also nothing I could do to make him love me any less. If you've been around freedom for years, I have been screaming this message for a decade. This is who our church is. We are not a religious bunch. Trust me. We have more people in our church with a record than any church in the history of the world. We do background checks on anybody that works with kids. Sometimes we get them back and they're 42 pages long. And we, that's not a lie. And we say, you will not work with the children. You will work in the parking lot. <laughs> True story. Where some people will say, you're not welcome here. We're just strategic where we put you. <laughs> you want to be on our security team? Perfect. I need people who are half crazy, just in case. <laughs> who would love nothing more than to take somebody out. Because they just did it two weeks ago. I saw it on their record. I want to be a church that comes to the understanding that it is not what you can do for God. That it is enjoying the fact that it's all about what God has already done for you. Jesus did the work. There is no work that I can do for God to make God love me any more than he already does. That is mind-boggling. It's hard to grasp, and I have to wrestle with it daily because I can preach it on Sunday and forget it on Monday because it doesn't seem possible that it's true because we don't live in a world that's like that. Jesus died the death that I deserve to die. He lived the life that I should have lived. What it proves, it proves to us that Christianity is not a behavior modification project. When we boil it down to Christianity being all about a bunch of rules that you need to follow, one, you've missed the point. And two, you've eliminated the joy. And if you miss the point and eliminate the joy, why would anybody want to go on this ride with you? When everything up here on this list is a got to, I got to get baptized. I got to go to church. I got to read my Bible. I got to pray. I got to give. I got to be nice. I got to stop yelling at the umpire. I got to do this. I got to do that. You fill in the blank however it is you want. When all it is is a bunch of got to's, and when all these are is a means for you to get closer to God, you will live your entire life disappointed and discouraged. And that was never the point. Jesus did not come to modify your behavior. Jesus didn't come to this earth so that bad people would become good people. That wasn't the goal. Jesus came to earth so that people who were dead could become alive. It wasn't for bad people to become good people. It was so that dead people would become living people. Prior to April the 11th of 1996, I was dead in my sin and did not know it. After April the 11th of 1996, I am now alive in Christ and am still coming to terms with it. It's a massive shift in how it is that we think. But when you can make that shift, it changes everything about your life. It's not a behavior modification project. Christianity is about a person. And that person is not you. The person that it's all about is Jesus. He's the one that did the work. Again, the gospel, the good news is about God's effort on your behalf, not your effort on his behalf. And until we realize it, any change we make in our life is superficial. Any change, superficial. That's why there's so much up and down. 
That's why there's so many got tos. The reason you got to diagnose. I mean, you need to self diagnose with some help. Where is it that you are? What is it that God thinks about you? Is it because you've embraced religion and tried to follow the rules? Or has your life actually been changed by God and you have a relationship and these got tos, oddly enough, feel a lot more like get tos? This is a self diagnostic tool right here. Is reading your Bible something you gotta do or is it something you get to do? Is prayer something you gotta do or something you get to do? Is going to church something you gotta do or something you get to do? Is being generous with the tithe, is that something you gotta do or is that something you get to do? If it's mostly gotta do's, then you need to evaluate and be honest and say, it's possible that I've lived a religious life but have never had a relationship with the Son of the living God. Again, Jesus didn't come so that you could be religious. Religion wasn't the goal because religion wasn't the point. And I tell you this not to freak you out so much as I'm telling you this to set you free. This is the reason we named our church what it is that we named it. I wanted people to be set free, not only set free from their sin. I wanted people in, we live in the South. I needed people to be set free from their religion. Because who cares if you're religious? Religion can be the blinders on your eyes that keep you from the relationship with God because you think you already have one. You got to see the got to become a get to. Now watch, again, I told you, I'm not attacking the what. All the things I said you should do. You should read your Bible. You should pray. You should give. You should not yell at the umpires too much. You should, you should do all the things that are on here, whatever it is for you. Do it. I'm not attacking the what. I'm attacking the why. You want to know how to get closer to God? The way you get closer to God is not by checking off boxes. I'm not closer to God because I read my Bible and pray and because I go to church. Those are tools in the toolbox that will help you. But do you know how I grow closer to God? It's going to sound too simple for it to even, for some of you, it won't even make sense. The only way for me to get closer to God and the only way for me to love God more is to realize at increasingly higher levels how much it is that God loves me. That's it. That's it. I don't get closer to God. I don't love God more because I read my Bible. I don't love God more because I pray. I don't love God more because I go to church. All those things help me. Those are good things. Understand what I'm saying. But what helps me to grow closer to God and love God more is when I read my Bible, I read about God's love for me. When I pray, I am seeing that he is patient with me and that he is kind and gracious to me. When I go to church, I hear messages like the one that you're hearing right now about how head over heels God is in love with you. Not because you're all that in and of yourself, because you are jacked up, and now because of Jesus, you are all that as a follower of Christ. You are the righteousness of God. You are loved. You are accepted. You are worthy. You are forgiven. You are chosen. You are a son or a daughter of the king. Not because you deserve it. Matter of fact, you deserve the opposite. That's why I don't like when people complain all the time because here's the truth every single one of us every single day is grace we should already be in hell for the lives that we've lived but because of Jesus not only is heaven my home one day but I get to help bring heaven to earth here and now not because I follow rules not because I check off boxes and not because I'm a pastor because I said yes to Jesus on April the 11th of 1996 and he accepted me and adopted me into his family and it wasn't on a probationary basis. He did not say, I died for you, big boy. Let's see if you can live for me for the next three weeks. I'll let you in. I'll take you off probation. 21 days. Day 20, you mess up. Shoot, day 20. Day one, you mess up. 
God pulls it away from you. That's not the way that it works, but that's the way that we live. No wonder we get frustrated, and no wonder so many people that say that they're followers of Jesus know that not everybody who says they're a follower of Jesus is a follower of Jesus. Please, for the love of God, understand that. The good news about the good news is that it applies to so, so, so many. But the bad news about the good news is that it doesn't yet apply to everybody. It doesn't yet apply to all. There's people that are in here right now. I mean, you're, you're listening to the words coming out of my mouth. And you are religious. And that's it. And that's why it's always been a got-to thing for you. And that's why it hasn't been all that it was cracked up to be. You always are wondering whether God loves you and likes you. God's love for you, is, if you're a follower of Jesus, is constant and secure. No one can take it. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you could ever do to cause God to love you any less. He said what he meant, and he meant what he said. But there's people here today, and maybe you're watching online, maybe you're sitting in the room, I know there are, who need to say bye to religion, and they need to say hello to Jesus. You need to say no to religion, you need to say yes to Jesus, and you need to do it now. Matter of fact, John chapter 3, verse 18 said, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. People ask me all the time, it's the same question they ask Jesus. They just think that if you're a pastor, you're supposed to know all the answers. But here's one I know the answer to. People say to Jesus, people say to me, what must I do in order to go to heaven when I die? What must I do to have my sin forgiven? What must I do in order to have my life changed? And you think in your mind, I'm going to give you chores on a chore chart. And if you can follow the rules and you can accomplish your chores, God's going to let you in. And God says to you right now, through me, that's the opposite of what he wants for your life. What God wants from you, watch, you ready? This is the thing that is mind-boggling. He wants you to just say, his way is better, his way is right, and I say yes to that. Jesus did the work. Everything I've tried to do in my life, everything that religion couldn't do in a lifetime, Jesus was able to do in a moment. And I say yes to that. So really, what he wants from you is not some thing. What he wants from you is to come empty-handed and say, Lord, I have nothing to offer you. I'm a jacked up, crazy individual. And I just need, I need you in my life now. I can't do this on my own. I need you to do it for me. And in that instant, boom, just like that, Jesus steps into your life. He forgives you. He makes all things new. He adopts you into his family. You walked into this room on your way to hell. You'll walk out of this room on your way to heaven. Not because of a message and not because of you, but because of Jesus and what Jesus did for you on the cross and through the resurrection. That's who Jesus is. That's what Jesus does. That's the message. That's been the foundation and the message of this church for 12 years. It will be the message and foundation of this church until I'm gone. Jesus did the work. Not you. Jesus did it. And we submit to that. And if you're ready to submit to that today, there's people in this room that are getting ready to say yes to Jesus. And when you do, it's going to be a surprise to the people that are around you. It's going to be a surprise to your family. I don't want you to walk out of here religious. I want you to walk out of here with a relationship with God. That's the most important thing. Bow your head and close your eyes. If you're here today and you're ready to say yes to Jesus, you're ready to say no to religion and yes to Jesus. No to your past, yes to Jesus. You're turning from your sin you're turning to Jesus. Jesus is your hope and your joy and your answer. He is the only one in whom you can trust. If you're ready to say yes to him today, then pray this prayer with me as I pray it out loud. Just pray it in your heart. Whether you're in the room or you're watching online, say, Lord, the best way I know how, I give you my life. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus. Lord, what religion could not do, I'm asking you to do right now. 
Lord, the best way I know how, I say yes to the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for saving me, for changing me, for making all things new, for adopting me into your family. In this moment, at this time, with your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, nobody looking around, I'm going to do something we haven't done in a while. But if you just prayed and said yes to Jesus with nobody looking around at all, I'm going to count to three, and when I do, you're going to raise your hand high. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to put a card in your hands. We're not going to do anything like that. I just want to see who you are. If you just said yes to Jesus right where you, I don't care if you're watching this in Starbucks, I want you to raise your hand. If you said yes to Jesus when I say three, you raise your hand high. Don't worry about what anybody else says or thinks. They're not even going to be looking. If you just said yes to Jesus right where you are, when I say three, raise your hand high. You ready? One, two, three. Let's go. Raise your hand high all over the room. Raise it high. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Who else? Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Good. Put your hands down. Put your hands down. Y'all can look at me. I want everybody in the room, pull out your phone real quick. Everybody in the room, even those of you that know what I'm getting ready to do and you're like, I don't need my phone. Pull your phone out. Pull your phone out. If you just said yes to Jesus, if you're watching online or if you're in the room, you were one of the ones that raised your hand. Right where you are, I just want you to take out your phone. I want you to type the word free, F-R-E-E, to the number that you see on the screen so that we can put some tools in your hand to help you as you take your next steps so that we can celebrate with you and let you know you just made the greatest decision of your life. A bunch of people, 14, I believe, in this worship experience that I could count. There may have been more. I can't see everywhere. But for everybody else, know this. If you're already a follower of Jesus, I hope that you walk out of here with a little bit lighter step I want you to walk out of here with your head held high, and I want, you, I want you to look in the mirror when you get home today, or look in your car, or that, that mirror, what's that thing called? The mirror up there? It's a mirror. I forget what it's called. I want you to look at it. It's called something. What's it called? Give me a name. Rear view mirror. I want you to rear view mirror yourself and just look at it and say, I am the righteousness of God. Be cocky about it, because it's, it's amazing to be able to carry that title. And the problem is not that we lack humility, the problem is usually that we lack awareness of who it is that we already are. There's so much more I could say, but I'm gonna save it to next week. Let me pray for you, then we got some stuff gotta do. Dear Lord, I love you, I'm grateful for you. I pray that you would move powerfully in this room. Thank you for so many people that said yes to Jesus. I pray that you would set them free. I pray that you would set the religious follower of Jesus free as well. Help us to see that you already did the work, that we can walk with our head held high because we are the righteousness of God. We are loved, we are accepted, we are forgiven, we are worthy, all because of the goodness of your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.